I grew up in Long Island, New York. I was one of three brothers. Had a very nice childhood, upbringing. My family realized when I was about two years old that I had an allergy to peanuts. There was one time I had a reaction, very slight reaction, but as a two-year-old, well, slight reactions can be significant reaction. There were some hives. Anyway, went through the tests for it, found that I have an allergy to peanuts and all tree nuts. So for most of my life and all my life, I avoid peanuts and tree nuts and do the best I can with that. And I never had any reactions or anything ever came up. And I moved to LA at 23 years old. I didn't know anyone, didn't know anything. I was full of life and I was gonna go make it big and start my career in real estate. And I was at a friend of mine's birthday party on a Sunday evening. I wasn't drinking at the time. I was fully sober, fully aware, just mixing and mingling with everybody. And up until that point, I never, that night, I never had a reaction. I never had anything close to a scare with a food allergy or a peanut or anything like that. They ended up serving cake. I take a piece. It looks like a regular chocolate cake. I just remember taking a little sliver of the cake and putting it in my mouth and then thinking something tastes weird. Wait, wait, there's a peanut in here. Something is off. And it was so quick. I didn't even know what it was because I, I honestly don't really know what peanuts or peanut or anything like that really tastes like. It just tasted off. And I was like, oh, wait, what is this? And then I end up swallowing such a small amount. It wouldn't even cover more than half the fork. And I thought, oh geez, I think that was a peanut. I, I don't know, was it? And then I go later to check that, oh yeah, there's peanuts in the cake. And at first my reaction was, who has a peanut cake? I've never seen a peanut cake for a birthday. Who is serving that now? Then from that point on, I think, all right, you know, okay, I'm fine, I'm fine, nothing happened. My mouth was maybe a little itchy. Maybe the, the, the bubbles in the soda will help, you know, my mouth. So I have, you know, a couple sips. I'm like, all right, I'm all right. No big deal. I'm going to go home, take two Benadryl, go to sleep, wake up and get on with my day for Monday. So I end up leaving the party. I go home. Everything's absolutely fine. It's probably around 9, 30, 10 right now. I get home. I take the two Benadryl. Then I go lay down. Lights are off. And I'm laying in bed and it's like 15, 20 minutes. I'm like, you know, I, I don't feel well. I'm feeling kind of hot. You know, I'm a little itchy. Something's off. My body's chemistry's off. You know, maybe I need another Benadryl. Maybe it's the Benadryl that's causing me to have this reaction right now. And I turn on the mirror and I remember looking and this moment was so profound. because This is the first time I sensed something could have actually really been wrong. I was completely red. I had hives all over my neck, my face, my hands, my armpits, my body. And I thought, okay, this is something more serious. I think, you know, I, let, let me grab the Benadryl, but at this point, let me also see if I can find my EpiPens, which are most likely expired at this point. So I then start digging through my little medicine cabinet and I came across my EpiPens and lo and behold, they were expired like six, eight months ago. So I thought, all right, great. Like this, is not, now we have a situation. And I thought, okay, what am I going to do? Then I start sitting there. And at this point, I was relatively okay. Then I was in pain. And then I just seemed to kind of like turn over where everything got much worse very quickly. What I was going through was the anaphylaxis. And that's when it started to speed up. Then the breathing got harder. Then I started to panic. Then my eyes were bloodshot. The redness came out. Then I'm like... <gasps> Am I breathing? Is my throat closing? Because that's what was going on. My throat would close during the anaphylaxis, so I was worrying about being able to breathe. But I decided to grab my EpiPens and drive myself to the hospital. I figured it was a Sunday night in Los Angeles. There was no traffic. It was around 10, 30, 11 o'clock. I was probably only 15, 20 minutes away tops. And I thought, you know what? This will be the fastest way for me to get there. And I remember driving and just going and thinking, how far am I going to make it before I have to use this epinephrine? And once you use epinephrine, it's very hard to have any other motor skills. You can't really move. You're not going to be able to drive. So I thought, let me just get as close as I can. And I'm driving and I'm driving. And I get to the hospital and I pull in and I stumble out of the car. And 
I have my wallet in my hand, and at this point, my breathing is really very difficult. I'm totally red. The nurse behind the desk looks at me and she goes, do you have any identification? And I just remember my hands trying to pull out my ID and I couldn't do it. And I remember falling, kind of like leaning over, and she jumped up behind the, the, the chair. The other nurse came around, they grabbed me, and they carried me back. And I remember being put on the bed and all these nurses and a doctor surround me and they cut off my shirt and I'm starting to fade in and out. They put oxygen on me. At this point, I was only taking in about 10% of the amount of oxygen you should be taking in. I had Benadryl going in through my wrist. I had an epidural going in as well. And I remember being in that specific moment and the doctor looked at me and said, I'm so sorry, I can't save your life. The epinephrine isn't working. Sometimes the anaphylaxis is so far that it can't be stopped, it can't be reversed, and they couldn't stop it. There's no oxygen in my body, I'm suffocating. I remember thinking to myself, like, this is it, I'm, I'm dying. Just feeling nothing and being accepting of it in a way. And I remember thinking that the only thing that really mattered was you know kindness and people and 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 nothing material mattered and it, i mean i'm laying here suffocated to death on a hospital bed away from everybody and things get very clear very quickly in that moment i remember laying there and just this energy of absolute euphoria and bliss and then that's it, like I'm, I'm done, like I'm leaving this. I remember not, I was not in my body at that point. Like I was gone. It's interesting, even, you know, seven and a half years later, it's still very hard to discuss. And I remember both my grandfathers who passed away, one many years ago, one when I was very, very young, few, like three or four years old, you know, coming to me in that situation they didn't say much, they just said very clearly, like clear as day, emotion direct was, you can't, it's not your time, you have work to do, you have to go back. And I, I didn't fight it, I didn't, you know, I've heard other NDE stories where they say, no, I want to go, I, I was just kind of like, I don't want to die anymore, that's it, I don't want it. Not that I ever wanted to die, I just kind of had the feeling that it was happening. I then thought, okay. I want to live. And then within a split second, even within that, when they're like, you have to go back, I want to live, and boom, I came back and I, for the first time and since I could remember, I felt pain and I was grasping for air and I was trying to breathe and, and I, I was responsive. And I wasn't responsive for the last 20 minutes before that. And I just remember saying, I need oxygen. I started speaking. I wasn't speaking at all. And I was moving and I was clawing. And I, was, I, I started to fight to breathe. And I was shaking so much from the epinephrine that they were holding my legs down. I remember my grandfather on my father's side saying, take it easy, which is something he would always say, which is really funny that like he's saying, take it easy when I'm like back and you know, and I'm back and I'm like <gasps> trying to breathe and I'm gasping and I can't speak. And he's like, take it easy, take it easy, you're fine. And it was almost a little violent when I first came back. It was just the noise, the light and the excruciating pain and that the emotion was back and the five senses were back. I was back in my body and I was consciously back in this realm and I was fighting for air and fighting to breathe. I eventually stabilized. The swelling went down, the hives went away, my breathing was fine. They monitored me for about eight or so more hours. I had no concept of time. I thought I was there for 40 minutes when I was getting ready to leave. They said I was there for about eight hours. The nurses said on a scale from one to 10, you were a nine and a half. We thought you were gone. We didn't think we were gonna save you. And you were unrecognizable from the person that, that, we, that we carried in here you're unrecognizable. They're like, we don't, we don't have an explanation for this. Sure, if you wanna go home, there's nothing we, we would keep you here. I always joke and I say, I really knew I was back to this world when I was at the hospital and then I left, I got in my car and I had to pay for parking. <laughs> so I was like, well, I'm back to the world in Los Angeles. I, I 
died an hour and a half, two hours ago, and now I got to pay for parking. The first five days after were extremely painful. I remember laying in bed for two or three days after where I just remember thinking it hurt to breathe. I had no idea what an NDE was. I didn't know what happened. I just had this insane experience that I didn't really talk about much. Once the pain subsided, I can kind of was able to really think about what happened and went through everything. And, you know, the biggest thing I remember every day for about six months, I would wake up and I would not know who I was. Things would happen day to day or emotions or thoughts, and I, I didn't recognize them. I remember my eyes readjusting. I ate a more vegetarian and cleaner diet. I slept less. I always grew up fairly intuitive. It was just, oh, I'm just intuitive. It wasn't anything more than that. But after the experience, I became much more intuitive. And in the years after, and also working on it, I, I've become you know, fairly psychic and, and have mediumship abilities. I don't know, I hear the term that they say they're gifts you come back with, or I feel they were always there, and I don't know if the NDE helped increase them or uncovered what was already there or just brought me to a different vibration. And then to go back to have people that, you know, I was friends with or fraternity brothers or my family or colleagues, and the people that then saw me when I went back were like, oh yeah, Chris is different. Now it's, you know, whatever, but there was a different person that came back. My values, ideas, and perception of self changed it. And I haven't given up motivation, determination, or, or ambition. I feel I'm more ambitious than ever. And, you know, sometimes I'll joke with people. I say, you know, if you think this is bad, you know, I suffocated to death. And, like, I, I'm going to do anything at this point. I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of failure. I'm not encumbered by anything. It still drives me to do well in business and life and be active and enjoy life more than anything. I mean, having had the experience of having it all taken away like that and then giving a second opportunity. Many people don't ever have a second opportunity. There was a woman months later that had the same situation happen. She accidentally ate a piece of, she had ice cream. And in the ice cream, there was a nut from cross-contamination, and she went into anaphylaxis and then went into a coma and then got out of the coma several months later and then since then has been in a vegetative state. So to go from something where I should have died, well, if I didn't pass away, I should have been severely mentally handicapped due to lack of oxygen to my brain, and I didn't. I walked out. That's always something that's grounded me and it's also at times a little scary because it shows how fragile life is and how clear life gets and priorities or what is and isn't important when you are laying, laying on a bed and you're dying. Very few things matter. It's dictated a lot of my relationships and how I've decided to live my life. I never spoke about this for six and a half years. I would not talk about it. Everyone knew I had a peanut allergy and that's it. People said, what happened is I had a really bad reaction and that was it. People would ask me, I would not discuss it. But what's given me that extra push is I've met people that have had experiences and others that hearing these stories and hearing others' experiences has really helped them. And given that I was allowed a second chance, I feel it's fair that I can give back. And if one or two people hear this and it helps them in any way, then that's fine. It's worth it to me. As difficult as it still is every moment I discuss it or even some days when I just deal with it, that's fine. So I found strength in that. It's very difficult using language to describe near death death experiences, because even when I talk about the experience, there's some things I can't use any language for to describe, or, you know, whether it's the beauty or the consciousness or the idea of being in that position. It, language is very, language I've realized from this experience is very limited. Having had my experience, I look at death as an event that's very natural and an event that's not to be feared. It was okay. And I live my life 
as much as I can in gratitude and look at everything as a blessing from here on out. It's really interesting, you know, I've always, as a saying, I always say, you know, even in life, I say, listen, unfortunately, bad things happen to good people. What I've come to realize and what I think is there's a consciousness and energy beyond us in this world that we don't see, we don't hear, we sometimes get glimpses of it. And there's a bigger plan or there's bigger reasons behind it there's always going to be pain and suffering in this world. That is always going to happen. It's a part of life. And as unfortunate as it is and painful and sad, I would feel that we just have to look at it differently and say there's something behind this that I don't know at the moment. Maybe eventually I will realize what it is or there'll be something more to it. I mean, how often have little things happened where, you know, you then find out a week or a month or a couple hours later, oh, thank God that happened. I, you know, good thing I couldn't find my keys. I, I didn't get on this and I avoided an accident. You know, we never know so much. And I feel with the bigger moments, with these tragedies, we look back and we say, oh, wow, like we, we didn't know. It could have been much worse. You're never gonna get rid of whatever happened to you, a, a tragic event, an NDE, anything in, from your childhood or adulthood or at any age. It, it's really a simple question of, well, we're not trying to fix anything, but really how can we take this event and integrate it into your life so you can function first and foremost, and then second from there, is there any way you can benefit and or grow forward and, and this make you a better person or you're able to share or go from there. And I, I feel there's always good in everything. And sometimes we're too caught up in the moment to realize it, or maybe it has to come later once the initial emotion's over. But there's always, from what I've seen, there's always something positive that can come out. And I've chosen to focus on that and learn and grow and evolve. And it hasn't always been easy. It's been very tough. Having had an NDE, there's been a lot of strong feeling of loneliness at times, even around people. You feel like you don't fit in. You feel that you're just like in the wrong place. Like you look around at society and say, what am I doing here? I'm longing for a home I don't know. You know, I always joke, I said, I, I've done every single practice modality of healing, visualization that you could ever imagine. Part of that was before I moved to Southern California, before I had a near-death experience, but I've done it all. Sound baths, Reiki, energy healing, acupuncture, tarot cards, crystals. I look at spirituality as a buffet, like a buffet at a restaurant. And there are, are certain practices that someone may resonate more with, and there's others that they don't. I'm not a fan of yoga. It hasn't done, for me, done much for me. I don't like it. I really enjoy sweat lodges. I really enjoy deep meditation and crystals and sound baths and energy work. And I love, you know, all the little witches and mediums and psychics and all of that. And there's not a one glove fits all and different healing practices affect people differently. And some things work, some things don't. And I always found that the word healing is not used in Western culture. It's just medicine and doctors and going to hospitals where really the issue is, well, why don't we get back to healing? Why don't we heal the soul? What really is causing this issue? It's not, you know, we always treat symptoms, but we never treat the actual root disease. And from my experience, I've, double down on really digging and doing work and spirituality is work working on yourself to wake up and be kind and non-reactive and hadn't seeing the bigger picture and trying to evolve your emotional and mental hardware it takes a lot of work it's not you know just sitting around with crystals chanting i mean yeah we do that it looks funny and cool but there's we're attempting to do work behind it and i would love to see where we kind of take away this comical look towards that because it does heal people and i feel that there's a lot of parts of our society and certain demographics that don't believe in that where they could really really benefit from alternative therapies because everything we've done in this you know in this country 
and I'll just speak about this country, is that it hasn't worked. We're fatter than ever, we're sicker than ever, we're unhappier than ever, homes are more broken than ever, relationships are more strained than ever, so nothing's working. It's the definition of crazy. You know, we, we need to return back to a sense of, of self and community and spirituality. We need to go back to what this healing, we need to heal as an individual, we need to heal as a family, a community, and then you heal as a nation. I feel that we are at a point in society and time where it's breaking, where the inequality of the haves and have-nots are so severe. We have major discrepancies in quality of life, opportunity. A lot of it's dependent upon where you're born. People all over the world don't feel that it's fair, and that I feel is an issue. When you don't have fairness, or I live in Los Angeles and you see extreme wealth on one hand, and then you see extreme poverty on one hand, and there's really like a no man's land in the middle, you think to yourself, well, you know, I'm just looking at this, I don't need an economics degree, this isn't working, this is not sustainable. Everyone's situation is different. I have some personal, you know, personal views on politics or economics, but I think regardless of what side of the spectrum you're on on all issues, political, economic, or social, the divide is how we get to the point we all want to get at. And I think we forget that. We all want everyone to be healthy. We want everyone to be happy. We want everyone to feel they have an opportunity. We want to be able to take care of those that truly can't take care of themselves or they maybe fall on hard times. The issue is we have different views on how we're going to accomplish that. And we only focus on fighting where we should really just say, hey, you know what, why don't we, we all want this to happen. So I would love to simplify everything and I would love to have something that's practical and start from there. And action breeds more action and then you can have change. I think at the end of the day, happiness in many cases is an individual's job. Everyone controls their own destiny to as much as they can. And there are people that have more than you, have had more opportunity, and there are people that have had less. And life will never be fair. There are times when it's not fair for you, and there's other times where you do have an advantage. And there's multiple ways of looking at that. You can look at that and say, hey, I didn't have all this, maybe I have to work harder. Okay, well then you gotta work harder. And I look at the state of you know, where we are, I mean, I, I think the world's always been crazy. And if we just got back to the idea of nothing complex, we make everything complex and we gotta do this, we gotta do that. If we just focused on local kindness and a, an idea of, like, of, of universal love, that's really all we need. I know it's very hippie, up high in the sky, but if we can just make it so basic where someone was just like, you know, I'm just going to be kind today. Maybe I won't beep the horn. Maybe I'll let someone go in front of me. Maybe, you know, I won't, I'll pause before I use this language or I do that or anything. Just the way we treat each other. I don't feel in any way if you're pursuing success anywhere in this world, whether you're in a city, whether you're a college student, you're a business professional, or a stay-at-home parent, why that would somehow prevent you from being kind and loving, why you can't be in a position where you can help others. I think that's a very convenient excuse the simplest thing can, can change someone's life. And we, we have this idea it's got to be something like so big and grand, but a simple hello in the morning or walking down the street and just piecing, picking up a piece of trash is, is, is significant. And we've seen to forget that. We've seen to have this idea that it has to be this grand, grand thing to save the world and do this and do that. And, Whereas the person that lives life well, cleaned up the neighborhood, hey, every morning, you know, he helped his elderly neighbor take out her trash. He did that. Or he, you know, he got flowers for someone that was in the hospital that there was an older woman that no one did that for. Those are what I've realized what really has an effect. And I think this whole idea of, well, I live in a busy city and there's this chaos around me, which there may be, but let's not add to the chaos.
you have that ability to not let it affect you. And we want to raise that vibration. We're not fulfilled anymore as a society. Every problem we have in the West now, many of it comes from a crisis of spirituality, a crisis of self where we've left it. And you know, if there's any problem, we run to a pill. If there's anything we need, we just swipe a credit card. You know, we never actually take a moment to stop and think and say, well, wait, why am I swiping a credit card? Why am I taking this pill? Maybe there's something I need to fix. And we have left the idea of getting back at the root and saying, you know, this might be painful, this might not be discomforting at the moment, but I'm going to correct this, I'm going to work on this, I'm going to shed some light on this, I'm then going to fix it, improve, and then you get the fulfillment and the happiness because, wow, I've done something, i changed something, I've built something, I've corrected something. If it's all easy, there's nothing left to do, there's nothing to conquer, there's nothing to achieve. And I use the word conquer as like a person, you know, I did something really well. I ran a marathon. You ever meet someone who meets a marathon? It's not the marathon, it's that they did it. It's that, oh, I lost 70 pounds and ran a marathon. That's where the happiness was. It's not that they finished, it's that they did it. It's that they corrected something. And we've, we forgot that. Like we forgot about community. It's not taught in schools. We forgot about health. It's not taught about what's proper to eat or what's the importance of clean water and air. I would love to see a real holistic wellness approach to health and lifestyle and balance. And from there, I think we can really connect everything. There'd be more opportunity and people would feel less disconnected. Because when you feel disconnected, when you have homeless encampments and then Rolls Royces, you just think, why do I care anymore? There's, you, you lose it at that point. It's just visually too much where you say, this is ridiculous. And I want to get away from that because that breaks down community. And I would love to see that and I would love for us to look at solutions differently and break down some of these old constructs we had of how we handled things and, and go from there and, and, and try something new for what's not working. And I feel we're at a point now where we have the ability to do that and we're looking that, and we can. And it's gonna start at a local level. And if we start with little things, the greatest things happen organically.